Good morning, Rutherford County. We're so glad to be with you this morning on our radio program. I'm, my name is Talissa. I'm here with my mom, Jeanette, and my sister, Kimberly. And we just want to share with you the goodness of God in our lives and how God heals and He restores the brokenhearted, the wounded, the abused, the rejected. Whatever you go through in life, God is always there to heal it and restore it if you cry out to Him. And my mom wants to share her testimony growing up and what she went through and what God has done for her and in, and in return what God has done for us girls. Um, but I want to start with a couple of scriptures. And the first one I have is in Psalms 147, and it's 3 through 8. And verse 3 says, He heals the brokenhearted, and He binds up their wounds, healing their pain and comforting their sorrow. Verse 4, He counts the number of the stars. He calls them all by their names. Verse 5, Great is our majestic, mighty Lord, and abundant in strength. His understanding is inexhaustible, infinite, and boundless. And then verse 6 says, The Lord lifts up the humble, and He casts the wicked down to the ground. You know, this has been our life story, my mom, my sister, myself, that God has healed the brokenhearted. He's bound up the wounds, and He's healed that pain. He's comforted the sorrows. And because of that, we've seen God's strength in our lives. We've seen His blessings in our lives. And we're just grateful, and we want to serve Jesus forever out of that gratefulness. In Psalms 40, verse 1, it says, I waited patiently and expectantly for the Lord, and He had climbed to me and heard my cry. He brought me up out of a horrible pit, out of tumult and of destruction, and out of the miry clay. And He set my feet upon a rock, steadying my footsteps and establishing my path. And you'll hear as my mom shares her testimony that that's really been what God has done. She was in a horrible pit. There was nothing but destruction ahead of her, destruction for us girls. And as she cried out to Jesus and she sought Jesus, we've seen God put her feet on a rock, steadying her footsteps, establishing her path to go in the right, right direction, and then leading and guiding my sister and I in the right direction, and steadying our paths and causing us to turn to the right direction. It says in verse 5, Many, O Lord, my God, are the wonderful works which you have done and your thoughts towards us. There is none to compare with you. If I would declare and speak of your wonders, there would be too many to count. And that's what we've all experienced. And my mom um, is going to sound, you know, share some of those examples of where she experienced God speak to her, where he, she experienced God show his love to her. And Really, all three of us, we could never compare anything to what God has done for us, and we're just grateful. And then last is Psalms 10, verse 17 and 18. It says, O Lord, you have heard the desire of the humble and the oppressed. You will strengthen their heart, and you will incline your ear, ear to hear them. And that's what we've seen God do in our lives at every point. As we've cried out to Jesus, it doesn't matter if it was oppression, depression, abuse, rejection, hurt, you know, whatever it is, God has healed those. He strengthened our hearts. And then it says in verse 18, He vindicates and obtained justice for the fatherless and the oppressed, so that man who is of the earth would no longer terrify them. And we've seen God be our Father and Father us and teach us how to walk with Him, and to serve Him with our whole hearts. And we're just grateful for what God has done in our lives. It's really a, it's a sign of wonder of what God can do. And we're just grateful. And um, I'm going to turn over to my mom to share, you know, she has a very unique story of how she grew up and, and then what she went through and then how she raised my sister and I. And I want to give her the majority of the time here. <laughs> Thank you. Well, good morning, Rutherford County. I'm glad to be here to share my testimony with you. I want to start with, I was born in a family of 15 children. I was next to the last, number 14, which I am so grateful. And I had 10 brothers and four sisters. And we were taught from a young age to work hard. We were in the bean fields and the cotton fields and potato fields, whatever my mom could find that we could do because my dad he worked in a mill but she had the younger children that weren't in school and she would take us to the cotton fields 
And the ones that were too young to pick cotton, we would maybe play around in the cotton field. And the ones that were old enough, they would actually pick cotton. Right. And it was a really, really good life. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed being taught to work. And we had lots of times around the table after we'd be in the bean fields picking beans and stuff. We'd be snapping them and stringing them. And my brothers would be eating some of them as we'd go. And it was just, it was a good life having a big family. We were never lonely. We never had to worry about having anyone to play with. We were had enough of us that we could actually have two teams and we could play ball and stuff together and all. And um, as far as, um, like I said, I was raised on a farm and my daddy pretty well provided all the meat. He would kill the hogs and the chickens and catch the fish and kill the rabbits or whatever. And my mom would always plant a huge garden that we all helped tend to. And through the summer, we would do a lot of canning and putting stuff up so we'd have food for the winter. Because with 15 children, there was a lot of food to be provided. But we never went without. We were always fed. My mom, she made pretty much all of our clothes. We never had to really go and buy much of anything. Um, as a matter of fact, it was really unique because if there was something I saw or my sister saw or whatever that they liked in a piece of clothing, my mom could actually go and just stare at it for a little bit and examine it and see how it was made or whatever. And then she could go home and replicate that garment for us. And so we could have clothes that looked like store-bought clothes, even though she made them. And it was just very, very nice growing up in a big family. And then I have actually a couple of pictures that will be shown for those that will be watching the radio program, viewing it on our website. The first one is where um, the newspaper somehow knew about our big family and was interested in coming to the house and taking a picture of all of us. And it had my dad at the head of the table with everyone sitting around ready to eat. Of course, my mom is standing to the side and I'm the baby that she is holding. My youngest brother was not yet born. And um, they titled it Passel of Pruitts because Pruitts was our last name. And so that's how they titled it. And then I also have another picture that you will be seeing. And it was taken in the later years, when I was probably about nine years old. My mom had all of us in our Sunday clothes one Sunday afternoon out lined up in the front yard and had a photographer come and take a picture of all of us. And so you will see that one as well. And uh, then um, continuing on, um, we were always raised going to church in a Baptist church. My mom was very happy to have a whole pew of herself with her children we did we took up that whole row and she was just amazed at that and um but the only thing about being in a big family that because caused some problems for me later was there was so many of us there was so much work to be done to take care of us to provide for us to feed us to clothe us that they never had any time to really sit down and spend some individual time. I never really knew what it was like to be hugged or told I love you. I felt that surely they did love me because they provided very well for us, but there just wasn't that time. There was always the busyness. And so as I began to grow and become a teenager, I longed to know what it was like to be loved in an affectionate way, not just cared for. And so I began to seek for that love in relationship. And I got into a relationship with um, someone that was a little younger than I and had came from a very, very abusive family and was full of rebellion, would not go to school, I'd go in the front door and out the back door, and therefore it resulted in him getting sent off to reform school. So from there, again, out of my rejection, I saw another relationship, which was very short-term, but 
as a result of it, I later, when the relationship was over, found that I was going to have a child, which was very devastating. I was not married. The relationship was over. And how old were you at that time? I was 18. And I really did not even know how to go home and approach my parents and tell them that we were going to, I was going to have a child. I was concerned how it was going to hurt them. I loved them. I didn't want to hurt them. I knew they were going to be very disappointed in me. And so I was tormented for a while, awaiting the time to tell them. And I finally did, and they did much better than I thought. They were willing to be there and support me. And they um, helped get things, you know, that we needed and get ready for the, you know, the child to come or whatever. But unfortunately, I had some complications. And so I began to go into premature labor at 26 weeks and I gave birth to a son and he was very tiny and had some complications himself and so he only lived for about 19 days and I lost him and that was very devastating and um, then the previous relationship that was sent to reform school had gotten out and came looking me up and wanted to get back into a relationship and we did we began to see each other and try to work things out and it resulted in marriage we got married we were married for about five years and it was not good like I said he had came from a very abusive family he did not know how to show affection. Um, so we were back and forth with our marriage. We'd be together and then we'd be separated and then he would come back and I would forgive him and we'd start again and it would just, it went on for five years and in the midst of it, we were blessed with two beautiful, wonderful girls. And, uh, but it did end in divorce because it just came to a point that I could not take anymore. And that in itself was more devastation in my life. I knew we couldn't stay together, but I did not know what I was going to do without him having a relationship. Because now I have two little girls to take care of, and he did not really want to be a part of that. Um, he would have some relationship with him, but for the most of it, he wanted to go on with his life and have other relationships and do what he wanted to do. And so there was a lot of hardships and struggles. I didn't know how I was going to work and take care of them at the same time. Um, I didn't make very much money. I had to really hear when I went to the grocery store, you know, how much I could spend because of paying for childcare, paying for rent, utilities, and it was a real struggle. And so I again began to search for a relationship out of my rejection and hurt, and I got into another relationship. And it was totally opposite of what it was with him. He was very good to me, he loved the girls, he treated them like his own, and so I thought, this is it. <laughs> I have gotten what I've always wanted and needed. At but, this time, were you in church, or had you stopped going to church in your walk with Jesus? Where were you at with during that period? I was not in church, and I had went back and forth to church a little with the previous husband, you know, and but it just did not last so in this relationship like I said the relationship felt like it was very good but he began to 
do and get into things that I thought I would never do. Speaking of like drinking, um, smoking, marijuana, and all. And so I found myself doing things that I had been taught in my younger years before any relationships growing up in church was not right. And so I was getting a little concerned, you know, but out of the rejection, I went along with it and tried to be something that I wasn't. And I did not really want to be, but I did not want to lose the relationship. So things got a little more involved to the point that he actually began to want to grow marijuana. He then began to bring people into the home and began to sell it. And I was getting very concerned. And at the same time, my oldest daughter here, Talissa, <laughs> there, we lived in a, a trailer park where there was a bus that would come through that was willing to take anyone to church that needed a ride and wanted to go, even if it was children and the parents didn't go. They would take care of them. So she wanted to go, and so I let her go. And so for, I'm not sure how long, maybe a month or two, she went to the church, was very happy. I did not, and um, the other one was younger, so I did not send her. And we later ended up moving uh, to another home, and when we did, that bus no longer came there, of course. And like I said, things were getting a little more involved. He was beginning to do more than I thought, you know, that we would ever do. And I, my concern was if the law was to come in and find that, what was going to happen to me, what was going to happen to the girls. And at the same time, my daughter is coming to me and asking me why she's not going to church anymore. And I had to explain to her that... How old was I at that time? Five years old? You were about five years old. I had to explain to her that we had moved and the bus no longer comes there. And she looked at me and said, Mommy, you have a car. Can you not take me? And... I did not know what to respond to her. And then she looked at me a second time and said, Mommy, don't you love Jesus? And at that point, it got to my heart. With the fear of what was going to happen if we continued in the life with the relationship and the law coming in, and then her heart was to want to know Jesus more and to go to church. And so... I began to, after I would put them to bed at night and get things done in the house, I would just go outside it was in the summer and I would walk around and look up at the sky and just start crying out, God, if you're real, you've got to help me. I don't know what to do. I need help. And out of that place, he did. He began to lead me and guide me. I got a new job. And there was a boss man there that he would come to my machine to check on me, to see how I was doing, ask me, how are you today? Are you okay? And it was not just a normal coming and asking, are you okay? I could feel his heart in it. He really cared how I was doing. And little by little, with that, I began to find out about him and why was he different. And of course, it was because he was a Christian. He was going to church. He was also in a Bible school. His name was Kent Covington. And little by little, as I kept inquiring, I felt drawn to that. And I began to really want Jesus. And I definitely wanted it for my girls. So I made a switch. I broke off the relationship. I moved out on my own again with the two girls. 
um, a trailer came open beside my brother and his wife, and so they helped me get resettled there. And it was on a Saturday the move was, and so we got everything situated. And so then that night I cried out to God, and I said, God, tomorrow is Sunday. I want to start back in church. I've been in and out of church through my young years, and so I don't know where to go in the morning. But I've heard that you will place people where they need to go in their life so that you can raise them and teach them and nourish them and all. And so that night I went to bed crying that out. And I said, so in the morning when I wake up, I trust I'm going to hear your voice of where to go. And I woke up the next morning and the first thing I heard was call your friend Kent and ask him if you can follow him to that church he goes to. I knew nothing about the church, did not know where it was, but I knew that I had heard God. And so I called him, and of course he said yes. I got in my car with my two little girls. I followed, I went over to his house. I followed him to the church. It was different than being raised in a Baptist church, but I knew it was where God was sending me and where I could find hope that I would be able to stand because, like I said, I never was able to stand in church before. I'd be in, I'd be out. I'd be in, I'd be out. And um, And this was in what year? It was in 1987. And so I kept attending the church. I began to grow and learn. I found many, many friends, and I had people that took us in and became a parent to me. I ended up with parents. They ended up with new parents as far as in the spirit that God gave them in their life, and our lives began to change drastically, and we, for the first time, found what true love was because when it comes out of someone that has the heart of God, you can feel, you can tangibly feel the difference. And our lives were changed. And I see my children today, their lives, they're so happy. Um, We actually, we all live together. I, my oldest daughter with her husband and my two grandchildren, they are twins, a boy and a girl, nine years old and my youngest daughter, and we are one big happy family. And we are still in the church and have been there for like 35 years and have never left, never turned again. I think Kimberly wants to share a couple of things with you too this morning. The biggest thing is that you can see where God places us in families. We may have not had much you know, there were times material things were short, but God always provided everything we needed. And my mom gave up a lot to make sure that we had what we needed and that we could serve God. And for that, we're both very grateful. And she always tried her best in all the circumstances we found ourselves in to make sure that we had the best we could have. And that's really the biggest blessing of having a parent, you know, that pushed us to serve God and even if she didn't know what to do or where to turn herself she would push us to people ministers that she knew would help us and like she said with Kent Covington became a very special place in our heart like a dad to us and his wife Brooke you know and we could always go to them at any point in time and they would help us and it was just such a blessing to have that and I'll say that kind of something kind of funny is, you know, when my mom got her new job and she needed somewhere to work, um, Kent at this time was working somewhere and um, he made it work out that my mom could come to work and my sister and I would go to his office and be with uh, Kent, Dad Kent, and we would sit there and my sister would, he would have this little whiteboard on the you know, or or chalkboard back then then, that he had all the plans for the day for the manufacturer, the shipping department, manufacturer, whatever department he was over, all his plans and 
Kim, Kimberly would climb up on his desk and erase everything on that chalkboard that day. Next day we come in, he'd put it all back on. She would erase it all again and play on that chalkboard. But you know, he never cared. He really took the time. Uh, with my sister and I, we were th uh, two and a half and five at that time. And he became a dad to us. Um, he became a father to us. He became a brother to my mom. Yes, he was a minister, but he took us in as his own family. And it didn't matter, you know, what my mom needed. He was there with was money. Uh, we had never been out of town before, never been on a vacation before. So he arranged for us to go to the beach to be with his mom and his sisters that lived there. And my mom had never driven. She's driving with two small girls. And uh, that day after work, we were going to leave, and he got everybody at the plant. They came and prayed over the car that it would make it all the way there safe with these two little girls in back. And that was just the kind of person he was, and that meant a lot to us. And so the one thing I wanted to share is in Scripture in Luke eighteen sixteen, and it says, Jesus called them unto himself, saying to the apostles, Allow the children to come to me. And do not forbid them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. And growing up through the years, that's been the truth of our lives. That I mean, God placed us in families. God called us to Him. We were allowed to come to Jesus. And because of that, all the blessings God's filled our lives with. And we're just so grateful. We are very grateful. And you know... Um, my mom mentioned the um, little story there when I was so young and I was asking her if she loved Jesus, you know, and that's really, I'd be honest, that's what's kept me today is something, a seed got planted in my heart. And, you know, and when God plants a seed, there's no devil that can come tear that up. There's no devil that can rip that up out of you. And that's really been what has sustained me through the years. There was something in my heart that wanted Jesus. And that cry was in me. And God answered it. And even as I was young, my mind necessarily couldn't comprehend what happened. But something happened on the inside of me that I saw God answer my prayer. I saw God answer the desire of my heart as a young age. And as we went through life, you know, I saw my mom me being almost three years older than Kimberly, I saw and understood a little bit more than she did. I saw the abuse my mom went through. I saw the hurt she went through. I saw my biological father abuse her, threaten her. I mean, violently. It wasn't just with words. It was physical and violent. And some things that small children should never see. You know, even when he remarried and my sister and I had to go visit him, my stepmom, we would wake up just screaming and hollering in the middle of the night. So we, we experienced that also as children. But, you know, seeing what God did for my mom and giving her a friend in Kent and then giving Kent as a dad to my sister and I and then coming to the Word of Faith, you know, a lot's been said about the Word of Faith. A lot of lies have been told. A lot of things have been said about Kent and Brooke. But I can tell you firsthand it's not that way. I've been here much lo longer than the majority of those people out there telling the lies because I was here before they were. And I was raised here, and I've seen the church from the very beginning, how it's changed, how it's grown. And none of it's true. We're living proof of you can come heartbroken, rejected, wounded, abused, depressed, poor, impoverished, and see what God does, how God uses his ministers and his people to change that and to turn your life around to something that is just beyond beautiful. And that, like my mom said, that's that's just the story of our life. And we're just, we're grateful for that. You know, it doesn't matter where you come from, what land you come from, um, the family background you come from, God can do miracles. And we're just grateful. God has truly restored what the devil meant from, you know, my mom's life. He restored it for my sister and I. And we're just very, very grateful. We owe our lives to God and we know that. And that's what keeps us is because we know it was God that did it for us. And therefore, our lives are owed to Jesus forever. And um, I just want to thank you for being with us today. Um, we're very grateful to be able, have an opportunity to share with you. We hope that um, it's encouraged you and blessed you. And we encourage you. There are other radio programs on our website at wordoffaithfellowship.org. A lot of testimonies, a lot of encouragement, a lot of miracles. And uh, we hope you have a great day, and uh, we'll see you again.